What's up guys? I'm Tim with Uncle Mike's. We're here with Toledo Indoor Garden and today we're going to show you guys an introduction to Mushroom 101. Come on. Well, thank you everybody for coming out and a big thank you to Toledo Indoor for allowing us to host this here today. Um, basically, I'm here today to give you guys all an introduction in how to grow your own mushrooms at home. Um, everything that we're going to go over today is going to be applicable to pretty much any mushroom that you could ever want to grow, whatever variety, whatever type, any of the fun stuff, this, that, the other thing. Um, most of what's going to really help you to succeed with this is a very small amount of research into the fruiting conditions for whatever you are trying to grow. Um, put it to you like this, a king trumpet is not going to have the same fruiting conditions as a lion's mane. Mm -hmm. It's going to have similar, but it's not going to be completely identical. One may want a little bit more moisture in the air, one may want it to be a little bit drier, one may need a higher oxygen content to get you larger fruits, so on and so forth. So a little bit of research takes about five to ten minutes for most of the strains that you could ever want to grow to find anything that you could ever want. Diligence before you actually get started is going to save you a lot of headaches in the end for figuring out what you're actually trying to fruit and get the best yield, best outcome from it. Um, basically, before you even get started, first thing that you want to do is decide where you're going to want to grow these mushrooms at. You're going to want to make sure that wherever you're growing them, it has some type of way to be able to actually be cleaned on the regular using some type of peroxide based cleaner. You can use bleach, you can use all types of stuff. You just want to be able to walk in there basically with pump spray or spray down walls, ceilings, whatever, and get it clean from floor to ceiling. Um, most of the time, we just recommend using tents. Uh, there's a couple great companies that you can order them through here at Toledo. Uh, they can order them from DL Wholesale, which is a tent called a Baby Maker. It's already got all of your shelves already pre-built into the actual unit for the tent. It's a good way to get started. It's a cheap and cost-effective way to get started. Um, so you'll get your area all cleaned up. You can use, again, peroxide-based cleaners. If you have something like Sanidate, Zeratol, uh, you could use 70% or higher of isopropyl alcohol, whatever you feel is necessary to get that environment clean. Like if you notice black mold or anything like that growing in that area, that's not where you want to be growing your mushrooms at. That is a competing bacteria or fungi. It will mess up your bags in the long run. So. Once you got your area that you're going to grow clean, you're ready to start everything, you're going to make a second area that you're going to work in. The second area is just going to be a nice, clean environment where you're going to be working with either alcohol or if you have one, an induction heater. Um, we recommend using induction heaters over the alcohol for cleaning things like scalpels just because that heat tends to kill more stuff um, and it doesn't tend to make you explode from lighting a lighter in a tiny little area after you just sprayed all of that isopropyl. So, um, what we like to do is as soon as, you know, we're ready to work, you're going to go ahead, get all of your <coughs> stuff that you're going to be working on in the immediate time frame that you're going to be working on it into that area. We recommend using a still air box or a flow hood. Preferably, flow hood is the way to go for anything that you're going to be doing with this, this is how you're going to keep down for 99.9% .9 of your contamination issues is with a flow hood. Um, these guys have like the Athena tissue culture kits. If you've already got something like that, that works great for people just getting started before you get a big two by four flow hood or whatever. Um, you can make still air boxes at home, super cheap. Go to Home Depot, pick yourself up a 30 gallon tote Make sure it's see-through so you know what you're working on in front of you and basically cut out two holes in it that's just big enough for you to put your arms into. Once you do that, again, you'll put all of your materials that you're going to be working on inside of the bin. You'll spray everything inside of the bin with alcohol. You'll wipe down the bags that you're going to be working on because everything that's going to be in there, you need to have sterile. If I say don't clean this off, before I go to inject my bag and I'm touching around and this and that, I've cross-contaminated, all right? Is it really likely that it's after you sprayed all that in the immediate area that there could be something? It's relatively low 
but it's never zero. So the more you are proactive with cleaning the area, you know, you think about it, oh, hey, you know, I had an itch and I touched my eye real quick, and you put your hand right back in there, all right, you gotta re-sterilize, all right? So the name of the game for all of this is keep up with cleanliness. Um, good example, everybody gets needles with syringes that they purchase usually, right? These get pulled apart so many times at so many different factories. It's not insane to think that there's maybe a micro nick in here and this didn't get fully cleaned or whatever, or hey, you know, you just got home, you opened it up, you set it down, all right? You opened it up and set it down, it's gonna have contamination in it. You're gonna have to sterilize it before you do anything with it. So just keep in mind throughout every little process, Hey, did I clean this? Did I spray this down with alcohol? Do I, did I get, this is the bigger one, inside of these seams. If you're gonna be transplanting, and you're gonna be opening these up, all right, everywhere I just touched in here, okay, this was sitting on a shelf for two months. You just went through this entire process to get it to a point where it's ready to fruit, and you just messed up the bag because you didn't clean the inside of the seams. So keep in mind, every little step of the way, everything has to be clean. So, before we get started in-house with any syringe that we use, personally, we shoot everything onto an agar plate to check it. This is your best friend for this entire process. Essentially, this is gonna give you a clone of whatever was in the syringe that you're starting with. So your 15 to $30, whatever you spent on that syringe that We'll only really do about two bags out of here with the amount of liquid that's in here. A plate can do anywhere from 15 to 30 bags. It takes approximately the piece, the size of a dime to start any size bag, a two pound, a four pound, an eight pound, whatever. You don't need much. But knowing that this syringe is clean before you even inoculate any of your bags is priceless information to you, all right? You go ahead and you just take this, stab it into a bag, you have no idea if it's clean or not for three, maybe five weeks in some cases before a bacterial infection shows or a trichoderma shows or whatever it could be showing. Um, so when you shoot it onto an agar plate though, you have results typically within seven to 14 days. You know that what you started with was clean and now you have a clone of what you started with that you can preserve off to the side indefinitely. Um, we will take these, we'll inoculate them, we'll put them on a slant in the fridge, uh, stays roughly about 38 to 45 degrees in the fridge. Having that slant, it takes longer for them to actually crawl up and actually fully colonize the plate so you can keep these for about six to eight months just sitting there doing nothing in your fridge that you know you have a backup of your genetic. Um, I'm gonna pass this around before we get started. So this is a living culture. Uh, this has actual living mycelium in it. Um, preferably, this is one of the quicker ways to get started. Uh, when you're working with spores, you're typically dealing with 300 gladiators going into an arena and one comes out victorious in the end and that's your genetic out of the spores. Living cultures, that is a clone of your best genetic. You found the biggest, happiest, best cluster of mushrooms. You took that, you put it onto agar, or you made it into a living culture and prolonged the genetics and keep them moving like that. Eventually, you can keep taking more and more isolations off of it, keep getting bigger, keep getting more larger yields, bigger flushes, everything like that. Um, but living cultures, knocks about two weeks off of your entire process versus spores. Spores will take anywhere from two weeks to four weeks to actually fully germinate and you see something, even let's call it about the size of a dime forming in a bag in some instances. And that also depends on how fresh the spores themselves are. Living cultures, great way to test them, leave them on your counter for two days before you actually inoculate them. At room temperature, that spore should start to actually, or that living culture, should start growing in that tube. If you don't see any growth in two days, typically what's in there isn't really viable and you wouldn't want to shoot it into a bag anyways if you didn't have like agar to actually test everything out on. Um, so, but yeah, 
living cultures, fastest way to get started, other than like agar. Of course, now when you put them in the fridge, mm -hmm. what temperature should they be in? Should they be in the freezer or the fridge? Fridge. You don't want to put anything in the freezer. Freezer will damage the mycelium. Fridge, if you stay typically 38 to 45 degrees, mm -hmm. so your typical standard, what you would keep a beverage at in the fridge is absolutely perfect for what you're trying to store. Any type of spores, any type of living culture, uh, any type of agar that's already got something on it. You can store bags, like good example, this bag is from December 13th. It took two weeks to colonize this bag fully after inoculation. And basically it sat in the, free, in the fridge at our shop until this point. These are what we use for all of our classes to demonstrate with. These are just pearl oysters. Um, but you can prolong the life expectancy for whatever you're doing just by keeping it cool. Um, typically in your room, you don't wanna keep it cool because it's gonna slow down everything. So like if your environment for where you're growing should be anywhere from 72 degrees to 76 degrees on the high end. If you're using bins, you're gonna factor in that the bin's probably gonna be about two to three degrees warmer inside of there because of its own ecosystem going on versus like if I just had a tent here with a rack and a bunch of bags growing like this, you know what I mean? You won't have to worry so much about the ambient temperature inside this bag versus a bin. Um, humidity wise, that's where, like I was saying in the beginning, you're gonna to have to do a little bit of research. Some mushrooms, super happy to be in anywhere from you know 80 to 90% humidity range. Other mushrooms, it's too much, and they tend to basically get waterlogged and do what's known as an abort. Uh, basically, the mushroom just, it's got too much, it's, it doesn't know what to do anymore, it's not trying to grow anymore, it just gives up. Um, you'll get the same effect if basically you had too much moisture inside of a bin and water droplets were falling off the top of it. You got to figure to a baby mushroom, a water droplet falling from six to eight inches is basically like somebody dropping a concrete brick off the Empire State Building. All right, that hits you in the head that you're done. Well, same thing happens with mushrooms. You get that little bit of moisture, it's just enough because it's going to keep happening routinely from all that moisture on top of your bin and it's just gonna keep dropping and keep hitting it on the head, and it's gonna abort. So if you're having a lot of those, that's where I would look first, is to see how much humidity you have actually built up on the lid to your bins. But, uh, temperature-wise again, 72 to 76 is like your Goldilocks zone. Anything higher, it will grow quicker. Anything lower, it will grow slower. Um, Lower temps are really only for certain strains in the gourmet world. Typically, you won't deal with it too much in most of like your portobellos and stuff like that, but you'll deal with it more in like um, your oysters. Like most of those will stay relatively cold. But higher you go temperature wise, it will accelerate your growth rate, but there's a fine line and you run the risk of more bacterial infections and more issues with trichoderma the higher the temperature goes. Keeping your agar on a tilt, is that saves it for way longer? Yeah, so basically, let's say this is sitting flat right now, yeah. right? It takes about two weeks to fully colonize this plate to go from absolutely nothing to this. I'll yeah. pass those around. Is that just the gravity? Then exactly. Okay. So basically that slope, and they do the same thing with tissue cultures in the cannabis community. That slope makes it so it's longer for it to actually get up there and do what it's going to do. Um, for us, it gives us about an extra two to three months actually stored in a fridge. Um, so while that's getting passed around, again, before we get started in house, we're gonna take our syringe we're gonna shake it up and you're gonna to wanna to shake it up for no matter what you're doing. If it's a living culture, if it's spores, move everything around, try to get a good consistent mix so that you're not just pushing everything that's in here into the one bag and not the other. Um, your syringes that you're gonna get from most companies are gonna be about 10 to 11 mLs. Um, personally, we use about a half a milliliter onto an agar plate um, and then we'll set this off again in the fridge. We'll leave the plate out on the counter for about a week to two weeks for it to actually develop. So 
we'll get started with that. Can, I, can we go back to what is the agar plate? So agar <laughs> is basically... Is that what um, I'm using for thickness? Like it's no. It, so yes and no. So like agar itself is like almost like a jelly is the best way to put it, right? This jelly has a food source to it, but just a very minimal food source. So what it does is it promotes the growth of the mycelium on the plate, but it also promotes the growth for any other things that could be competing with it. So like the two plates I just passed around, one of them is completely blank, there's nothing on it. The other one is completely healthy, nice white mycelium. This one, where everything's around the edge, that's a bacterial infection that started on that plate. It completely wiped out the mycelium and all you see is what's around the outside. This one is a trichoderma. Basically, that one turns nice and white, it looks beautiful, it looks like you're winning at life, and then all of a sudden, overnight, it turns green. Hmm. So, that's what you call it, trench. Yeah, trichoderma, yeah, trench. Yeah. There's bunch of other names, um, but most of your competing molds, bacteria, and fungi will show up on those plates before you even inoculate your bag. So it gives you a good estimate of, hey, did I buy a good quality syringe from somebody? Was it clean? Was it this? Was it that? Before you waste all your hard-earned money dumping it into a bag and wasting it entirely. So it's a proper way to get started where you can always check and see and you know for sure that what you put into the bag was clean. Because then you can go, hey, I checked this on the agar and I put it in your bag and it didn't work, sorry. We already know that your syringe is clean, so it was an issue with the bag and we get those replaced. All right, so it's a little extra. Where do you get these agar plates? The agar plates, uh, Toledo Indoor does sell them here. They can order them for you as well. Um, they usually come in a six pack. Um, it's just the easiest way to do everything with all this. But So we're going to imagine that I am currently working in front of a flow hood or inside of a still air box for what we're about to do. Um, I'll get that out of the way so you guys can see a little bit better. Uh, we're going to test our syringe. So in a perfect world, you're in a still air box, you got a flow hood. I personally spray down the area that I'm working in. You are going to prep everything. I only take the seal off before I get started and just have that ready. Again, anything you're going to be touching, you're going to want to clean. Try to prep as much of it as you can before you actually start doing the work. So, you know, shake your syringes. I like to take a little bit of alcohol, spray the actual syringe itself. It's not going to hurt anything. The bigger thing is making sure that if you do have alcohol on your hands, do not light your hands on fire when you go to sterilize the needle. While it is fun, it is toasty, and it's cool, it doesn't look good on camera. So, and again, we're imagining that we are inside of a still air box or working in front of a flow hood. You've already shaken it. You've got the uh, material off of the plate itself. You are gonna take your syringe, and you're just gonna get that needle just barely in there, and you're just gonna put a very tiny amount onto that plate, all right? Once you get on the plate, all you need to do, take a little bit of micropore tape. That's just a breathable material. It allows everything to transpire inside of there so that you have nice, healthy mycelium developing. Uh, but essentially, you'll take your plate, just seal it back up. Did you actually touch the agar? No, you are trying to basically hover over it. Um, usually you do not want to um, pull the lid off entirely with the agar when you're working with it. You're essentially just trying to make a very small little crack for you to get that needle through just enough to be able to put something onto the center of the plate. Um, once you do that and you seal it up, realistically, it can sit on the counter, it can sit out anywhere. It's going to take at least five to seven days for you to notice anything. Um, in 7 to 14 days, you should see most of your bacterial infections, if there was anything, or trichoderma, cobweb mold, whatever the case may be. Hey, you know, I'm growing this oyster strain, okay? It's, there's red on the plate. What's that mean? Well, you don't have a pink oyster, you've got a pearl oyster, so you know that that's some type of competing mold that you've got to get rid of. 
So once you see any type of contamination on those plates, it's not completely game over for you. You can clean those plates up and take the healthy mycelium that maybe started off in the corner, cut that out and put it onto another plate and let that grow out and keep cleaning it up over three or four generations of these plates. And now you went from, hey, this was complete crap. It was destroyed. Oh my God, trichoderma, this, that, the other thing. Well, now you have a completely healthy, viable genetic that you've cleaned up from beginning to end. So that's why these are really your best friend throughout this entire process. Um, so we're gonna imagine that We've gotten ahead. All of our agar has come back. It is nice, healthy, white. It is happy. It is flourishing. We have two choices now. We can either use this agar to start our bags, or we can use the syringe <coughs> that we put onto here. Um, some people prefer to use up that syringe just so that they know it's done, it's over with. They got a clone sitting in the fridge, whatever. Personally, I like keeping these syringes because I can go back, I can fill up as many agar plates as I want, and I can just do my bags with these. It takes, again, about the size of a dime out of here to start a bag. So you think about it in the grand scheme of things, this is 15 bags, whereas this is two, because you're using three to five ml to start any bag. Whether it's living culture or spores, it takes three to five ml to start a bag. So. In a perfect world again, you're working in front of a still or in front of a flow hood, or you're working with a still air box or something. If you were going to do your bags, you're going to clean off the front. 70% or higher for isopropyl alcohol. 70% is the lowest you want to go. That will give you the most amount of contact time on the surface for the, what you're spraying it onto. 90% evaporates a little bit quicker. It's better for a little bit more fast pace. Um, depending on what you're doing, just make sure that when you do 99%, you're getting everything. Don't just focus on the patch or focus on the immediate area. Make sure you're taking the time, fold open the gusset, spray in, you know, because this is going to be sitting on a shelf for anywhere from two weeks if you started with a living culture or agar to about roughly eight weeks, I would say, in the long run for some type of spores that are out there um, so patch is cleaned up again clean your hands clean the needle if you've already used your needle we're gonna wait for my hand to get rid of some of this alcohol so I don't blow myself up <laughs> be cool on camera. no it does not <laughs> funny story it did that a few months ago back when we had a snowstorm up north not fun everybody just thought it was a uh, part of the act it's not <laughs> so if you've already used this needle, you're gonna sterilize it with heat. You don't have to get it glowing red hot, but you should be able to see it pushing some moisture on out of the needle itself. You're gonna wait for it to cool down. It takes roughly about 30 to 45 seconds. If you're in front of a flow hood, it's gonna take you like five to 10 seconds because you got that air blowing across you. Once it's cooled down enough, directly into the center, you're gonna put three to five ml into any bag. Doesn't matter if it's a four pound, doesn't matter if it's a two pound. It only takes three to five mls to get it started. More is not always better when it comes down to moisture with mushrooms. So, now that it's been injected, normally, you'll start to see a little bit of pooling on the very bottom of these bags. It is a good practice just to, every couple of minutes, rotate it while you're working on whatever else you're working on. That's gonna help disperse that spore or living culture, and it's gonna give you more contact area with the actual grain inside and give you a better overall chance for getting something started. Once you've done that and you feel confident that it's not pulling up on the bottom anymore, Put it on your shelves. Put it wherever you're going to be storing this for the next couple of weeks, preferably in a dark area. Um, I still like pumping in fresh air to the area through filters. I use HEPA filters, um, just low CFM. 
You can use anything from about, uh, say, like a six inch inline fan up to about an eight inch inline fan if you have a, a controller for it to turn down the CFMs. But basically, just a little bit of fresh air because these bags are gonna start producing CO2 pretty rapidly once they get formed. Just good practice to have. They'll give you larger fruits if you're working in that area as well as, like if you're fruiting in that area, wherever you're gonna be storing these at, a little bit of fresh air will go a long ways for you. So. What, uh, what temperature <clears throat> at that point? Is it for the still... whole way from beginning to end, okay. you should be at 72 to 76 degrees. So whether we just inoculated or we're fruiting, we're gonna stay in that same Goldilocks zone yep. to keep everything moving, but also keep down on bacterial or other competing fungi infections. Um, you can go hotter, you will get slightly bigger mushrooms sometimes. Most of the time it does not work that way. Most of the time what ends up happening is you get over the 76 mark and bacterial infections start becoming rampant. Um, mostly due to the mushrooms themselves that have already started in this. Like if you look at these bags, there's a little bit of metabolites, which is that yellow kind of watery looking to pass that around. Now does it have to be dark in the room or can it be light? Only for this portion and even then, in house I will tell you straight up, all of our lights are on 12 hours on, 12 hours off. There's no difference. We One side of our room is, you know, all stuff brooding in bags. The other side is all spawn that's getting started. Okay. It'll do it. Right. Takes a little bit longer. You okay. can run the risk for other things just because that beginning stages, you have nothing really to built up where it'll eat any type of competing masses that's in there. So like that one right there, if I were to cut that open and just let it sit out here, it'd take a while for it to get right. contaminated because it's already got a healthy mass that can compete against anything else that's trying to come in. But when you're first starting off, dark. dark. Because any type of light it was gonna aid in bacterial, it's gonna aid in this, it's gonna aid in that. So you're just trying to keep the beginning portion as dark as possible, but you don't have to. And how long do you keep it dark? Uh, until that bag Start. looks like that. Once you get to that point, Sky's the limit with what you can do with it. Does it make a difference on like color of the light versus like green with it? It's not gonna affect it. So lighting color doesn't really matter for mushrooms. Okay. Um, mostly what the light is there for is just to give you a direction for the mushrooms to grow. Um, for most variety of mushrooms, if you, they'll grow completely in the dark. Um, the only difference is instead of having a nice straight up mushroom like you would down. get, it'll go down, it'll curl around, it'll do this, it'll do that. So the light's just there as a direction to grow up and you only need it for a maximum of 12 hours on. Um, so we're gonna say that this bag has now reached capacity. It's just as white as that bag is right there that everybody's passing around. Um, you'd be ready to put it in the substrate at that point. We do a couple of different methods in-house it depends on what you're growing, top fruiter, side fruiters, how much area you have to work with, how much area you want to dedicate it to. At the end of the day, while bins are great, they've got their own little ecosystem going on, they're pretty self-contained. If you can get away with doing bags, you will hit much larger numbers across the board for what you're trying to grow versus bins any day. Um, most of that is because I can take this, and I can put 15 of these across that shelf on each shelf. I'm only gonna be able to fit three or four bins. All right, out of the life of these bags, or out of the life of these bins, you should be able to harvest anywhere from three to four times out of it before, hey, we've messed around, you know, we've plucked out all the <laughs> mushrooms so many times and this and that. Hey, one of the ones that I plucked didn't exactly get all of the base with it and that started to rot. Now you got contamination and you're getting rid of it, you know. Three to four is a very healthy number of flushes or harvest for anybody to, you know, aspire to hit. Basically, if you're getting one out of it and that's it, you need to work on cleaning up around your area. Nine times out of 10, if you're only getting one, when you went to go harvest, you didn't spray your hands down good enough with alcohol. Like you should be soaking your hands, rub them around, whatever, before you go to start working in any type of bag. 
put it in front of your blow hood, put it in your still air box to, you know, harvest from it, whatever. But keep down on whatever contaminants can be around you by just staying clean with it throughout the process. So, let's say this bag right here has reached capacity like that one back there. We're gonna go ahead and we'll have our uh, spawn and we'll have our substrate. We're gonna go ahead and start cleaning them up. You'll again, make sure you get in the gussets, spray everything. You can spray the filter patches on these. It's not gonna hurt anything. I will go one extra step farther. If you don't have like a rack that you're working on in front of your flow hood, you can put down a couple pieces of paper towel even, spray those down. Just whatever you feel you need to do to keep that sterile environment that you're gonna be working with. So again, spray down the bags, everything that you think you're gonna to touch throughout this process. And I mean everything I try to get the ones on the bottom too. It's not always as easy when they're that colonized. But typically, once you get to that, before you do any type of transplanting, you are gonna break up that mass. So it's something that you're not gonna be sticking your hand into to break up in their bins later. As much as you can do before you have to open anything, it's gonna be uh, proactive in keeping down on contamination. So if I can break this up, get a good healthy mix out of that nice white mycelium there before I go into here, it's less time that you're gonna be messing around with all this stuff. So, in a perfect world, this is nice white mycelium, right? I'm just gonna assume it is because we don't have two months to wait around for me to teach the rest of this class and go, hey, it's finally ready. We just want samples. Exactly. <laughs> we'll wait two months. Yeah. So we're gonna cut the tops off. <laughs> And again, you want to be doing this still airbox or flow hood. Still airbox is better than nothing. So for 25 bucks at Home Depot, you can save yourself a lot of headaches just putting a couple of holes into a bin. So you sprayed everything down, get your substrate open. Once you open these, everything is a ticking time bomb. The longer you mess around with this stuff, the worse off you are going to be. I typically do two to four pounds, or a two to four ratio. So two pounds of spawn to four pounds of substrate is what I like doing in-house for most of our stuff. Once you get it in, shake it around. And this is one of the added benefits to doing bags is being able to actually do that all right you're not sticking your hands in there like you would with a bin like i'm going to show you guys in just a minute here um it is an extra way of keeping down on contamination typically a little bit of uh micro pore tape just to hold that bag shut because it's going to take about two to four weeks from this point before you have mushrooms that are ready to actually start fruiting or pinning or whatever um, just keep that sealed. You can use binder clips, you can use paper clips, you can use whatever your heart desires just as long as it keeps this closed. That is the main importance of it. Um, bigger thing is, when you're done, if you notice that there's clumps in it anywhere or spots where you don't see a whole lot of grain to the actual substrate, you want to keep mixing it around a little bit. You want to get as consistent of a mix as you can throughout this whole process. Pass that around. Yep. That is basically what you should be looking for when you are done. Is that last bag from your last class, will that fully colonize like that without the mycelium building on it? Uh, that right now I guarantee will still grow because yeah. the oysters that I shot into that initial bag yeah. are absolutely out of this world, don't care about your feelings, yeah, they yeah. will grow in the sidewalk, whatever. <laughs> um, actually, last class that we did, we did a bin and one of the guys in the class asked me, he was like, you know, what's the chances that you just working on it, even though you cleaned it and this and that, is it being contaminated? It's like, there's about a 75% chance and I'll be damned if I didn't get home. I left that sitting there for about a week at our shop and it's full of freaking oysters wall to wall right now. It actually blew out our filter patches on it. So it will grow. It's not all strains are as aggressive as that. 
but nine times out of ten, they're just gonna do whatever. Like we make pre-mixed versions of these all-in-one kits, where you can just inoculate it. They work great for culinary. They don't work so great for some of the other ones, just because there's too much moisture typically in the actual substrate itself. So you got three months or three weeks of growing before it hits that substrate layer and now it's got all this food and everything else so you gotta kind of pay attention to what you're doing with it but so that is the bag method um once you mix those bags up typically you want to give it about another seven days of darkness um in seven to ten days you should see that block that you mixed back to about as white as this so if you aren't seeing it get to this or Maybe you can even see it where it's got some of the actual substrate still exposed, but it's starting to pin or whatever. If you're not seeing that within seven to 10 days, usually there's some type of contamination in there. You should see tendrils coming up. You should see this wanting to do something within the 48 to 72 hour mark, whether you're doing bags or bins. Um, that's roughly how long it'll take to see any new growth. It's just like transplant shock with most of your plants. You, you're breaking this up, you're doing a lot of damage to the mycelium, it's not an instantaneous thing where it's going to be like, hey, I'm just magically okay after you just beat the crap out of me, you know? <laughs> but, um, anyway, so going on to these bins. Bins are probably the easiest way for most people to keep down on contamination their first couple of times, just because, you know, if you don't have a tent, you don't have a room, you're not the greatest on overall cleanliness. You can filter patch these out. You can put micro pour tape on them. You can do whatever. It's just an overall easier method for beginners. Um, personally, any bins that you're gonna buy, try to find something with a foam gasket. That foam gasket and this not having any holes in it other than the ones that you're gonna put into it are gonna be your best friends for keeping down on things like fungus gnats and other bacteria or anything really getting into these bins. Well, I know a lot of people like to get those like 16 quart shoebox bins. They don't have foam gaskets. Typically the actual clasp on them have a hole that goes to the inside. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna get fungus snacks. You're gonna get something in there that wants to eat on that mycelium or hurt it. Just spend the extra couple of bucks. Make sure that the bins you're getting are able to be fully sealed up airtight. Um, any bin that you make at home, you are gonna put your uh, quarter inch holes roughly four and a quarter to four and a half inches up from the bottom. When you're working with any type of bin, you want at least a three to four inch cake. And what I mean by that is once you have mixed your spawn and your substrate together inside of this bin, it should be at least three inches tall. If it's not, you are not gonna get as many flushes as somebody else who would. Um, typically, with that three inch cake, you should be able to get four to five flushes out of it. A four inch cake, add an extra two. Um, it's just more mass for the mushrooms to actually eat off of throughout this entire process. So, you got your bin, you put your quarter inch holes about four and a quarter to four and a half inches above the bottom. You're gonna put two holes up top these holes can be anywhere from an inch and a half to two inches. Most of you guys got a hole saw at home. I know you're all handy and can do this. Um, one on each side, all right? We usually cover these up with mason jar filter patches. These are probably the easiest, dumbest thing that you could ever order off of Amazon. You get a 50 pack for like five bucks. And all you're gonna do is peel them off, stick the mason jar filter patches over your holes and seal it up. You're gonna take your micro pour tape and you're gonna put it over the quarter inch holes on the very front and on the back. If you do this right and you have these uh, you have that neoprene insert on here around the top, the only air exchange that should be happening is what the mushrooms are gonna create. So essentially your holes down low is gonna be where your CO2 is actually escaping from this bin. 
which is then in turn forcing fresh air to be pulled through these patches up top. If you are doing bins like this and you have done everything appropriately, you should not have to fan these bins throughout the process. If you do notice anything weird happening where, or hey, it's been 14 days and I, the whole block has turned white in here and I still don't see pins, okay, you have a very aggressive strain of mycelium. Chances are it's producing too much CO2 in the bin. It can't get enough out and get enough fresh air in. That would be the instance where you would have to actually fan these. And when you fan them, it's just two, three little passes like that and close this back up. You don't want to sit there hard as hell, you know, fanning this like your wife's hot on the patio. Like, you want to be taking care of it, all right? So, with that being said, the CO2 holes at the top of the bags, if you're using bags? If you're using bags, you're going to end up cutting holes in this, which is what we're going to go over in just a minute here. Um, it's... But you don't use it, though. What I'm saying is it's not the same as far as doing with the filter. No, no. You're going to... The holes you're going to do on bags are going to be completely different than somebody doing bins. Um, the bins... Again, this is meant for somebody who's got a smaller area to work with. They're not as controlled. That's what the bins are here for, is for you to be able to control as much as possible. In a perfect world, bags are just going on a shelf. You hit your 14-day mark and you start seeing pinning or you see that that block is totally white and you're cutting the whole top off of it in a perfect world because you've got HEPA air flowing in there. You have a good CO2 exchange, so that air that's heavy down low is getting pumped out of there, so you're getting larger mushrooms from the fresh air exchange. Um, your humidity's in check, all of that fun stuff. You will never get a bigger yield than a bag sitting in the open that's able to be in a sterile environment like that. And here, you're battling CO2, you're battling this, you're battling that, and it's just doing what it can for what you have to work with. If you've got a rack and there's, you know, let's say it's a four foot wide rack, that's pretty standard for most people. You have six shelves. On each one of those shelves, I should be able to fit about 12 to 14 bags, all right? That's a ton of CO2, so I have my fresh air exchange. I'm pumping HEPA air in. I'm <coughs> pulling CO2 out from down low. I'm keeping my oxygen levels in check while staying relatively about it's about 400, 450 parts per million CO2 is what our readers typically show inside of the rooms. In that range is your Goldilocks for getting larger mushrooms. If there's too much CO2, instead of having a nice thick, like your thumb stub coming up, you're gonna get something that's almost as thin as that. And it'll start coming up super thin like that. The head's not gonna get bigger, it's just gonna stay this little pit. If that's the case, you need more fresh air, and you can either A, fan it, or you can pull off the down low um, micropore tape on these to allow fresh air in. You're gonna run a risk for contamination doing it, but it's better than the alternative, so. So micropore tape is on the bottom, not the, and then on the top is just the mixture of filter? Correct. Uh, these just tend to have a little bit more uh, security as far as not allowing things in. Um, but as far as down low, you need something slightly more breathable than this for the CO2 to push out of. Do those come in different like, um, like filter ranges or something? Or so I have found two to three different filter ranges for these. The one that pops up on Amazon almost instantly for everybody is going to be your standard. I think it's like uh, 0.23 micron or something like that. Like it's ignorantly low. Um, that filter patch and most of the filter patches that you can buy are going to be probably your best bet versus micropore tape as far as keeping down on like trichoderma and stuff of that nature. Um, micropore tape, it's you can put more layers on and protect against a little bit more. It makes it harder for things to grow through it, but eventually over enough time of you know air exchange, it'll pull something in. How much oxygen is needed? Uh, relatively low. It, the bigger thing is, is like, like you're not going to be using an oxygen tank like you would for CO2 in the cannabis grow. You know, you can. Is there any would. risk of these two together? Like, you know, saying like microbials for cannabis and then doing that. Oh, 
Oh, 100%. I mean, technically the dirt you're leaned up against right now has about three different species of bacteria and fungi in it. The one next to it's got a bunch of mycorrhizae. The one next to that one's got trichoderma. Those should be in separate areas. They should be in completely separate areas. The only time mushrooms should ever be going into your grow room is if you're using them for like a CO2 bag, okay. you know? Like, and that's a good cheap way of making your own CO2 bags at home. But, so. Do you recommend Spraying uh, that down with alcohol before you plant it. 100%. Um, basically, think about it like this. Let's say I already transplanted into here. If I'm going to work on any of these bins, anything I'm touching, you want to spray down. So if you know you're going to touch this lid, all right, I'm pulling this lid off. Anything that was on top of here, you're going to fan it. That just dropped it. Now you just blew it in. You know. So keep in mind again. Everything comes down to how sterile you keep everything. Depends on how many flushes you get and what the overall outcome that you get out of it. With that being said, so every time you open that lid, it should be clean. It needs to be clean, 100%. Um, basically, just attach a spray bottle of alcohol to your hip. Right. You know, walk around. Hey, I gotta open up that bin. You should still be spraying it. You should be spraying your hands down. You know, if you're gonna get in there and you know do a little peekaboo. Put a mask on. That's a big common mistake that everybody seems to make is they think that, hey, you know, oh, my, I've brushed my teeth, everything's in the No, you're still blowing stuff around from talking. Like there's stuff in the air that you just don't see that you'll never register on any type of eyesight. You could have the most perfect vision in the world. You never see the particle that's floating around in front of you. So just keep it clean. Um, so prepping these bins, You'll spray down with alcohol. I will typically let the alcohol sit. I'll give them a good wipe down if I feel like they're a little bit dirty. Bigger thing is spray the patches down with alcohol inside and out. You never know. It should take roughly about a minute or so for this to dry off if you just want to spray it down like that and actually work on it. But in the meantime, while this would be drying in our still air box or in front of our flow hood, you're going to prep your bags again. If you're spraying that down and not wiping it off, it's less chance of contamination too, right? To an extent, yes. To an extent, no. Um, use your better judgment. If you look in that bin and you see any type of particulates in it, you should be wiping it down. Um, basically, if you don't think you would eat off of it, don't worry, don't, don't mess with it. You know, granted, I know quite a few people in my life that eat dirt on the regular. <laughs> Not encouraging in this scenario. So, you get your substrate bag all wiped down. Now, what percentage of alcohol are you using today? I am using 99%, um, just because it makes it a little bit easier to work with. It evaporates a little bit quicker. Um, so if you're doing a lot of them, you're not running the risk of blowing up as much. But once you get everything sprayed down, like I said, break up as much of that as you can before you go to mix it into your bin. The less time that you are sitting there hovering over this while you're working, the better. Every, let's say about 10 seconds that goes by, you're going to run into another risk for contamination. So, again, we're doing this in a still air box or in front of a flow hood. You spray down your bags entirely. You're going to cut open your substrate. I personally do not use any type of bin liner. It is another form of contamination as far as I'm concerned. Nobody ever gets their bin liner perfect. All right. So, get our substrate in. I will put about three quarters of the substrate in itself and leave a little bit off to the side. We're gonna use that as a casting layer. You do not have to do any type of casting layer on top for most of your mushrooms. They will typically grow just fine. It's just there as an extra protection. Um, all right. So, now that I've got everything in there, 
I like spraying my hands down one extra last time because you are going to be sticking your hands into this bin if you are actually doing bins. Try to get as much as you can. Go up your arm a little bit with the alcohol. You have to. Once your hands are almost fully dry, you're going to actually physically start mixing everything in your bin. And mind you, again, the longer you stand over this, if you're talking with a friend, whatever, that's going to be running into your contamination. So if your partner's working right next to you and you're both talking back and forth and I'm standing over this, chances of contamination are a lot higher. So it's finally a good way to encourage your partner to be quiet for five minutes. So once you get it fully mixed up, you're gonna gently pat it down. You do not wanna pat it down until the point where you are seeing moisture sipping through your fingers. If you do, you have pushed way too hard and it's probably gonna hurt the mycelium. Once you have it patted down, we're gonna take the last of our substrate. And again, this isn't necessary. It's just a little added protection across the top. It gives the mycelium underneath a little bit of time to actually start growing and protecting itself before any type of contamination could hit it. So, and you want that layer up top to be basically paper thin. Soon as you're done with that layer, get the top on it as fast as you can, close it up, label your bin, whatever you're gonna do, however you're gonna do it, anything like that, all right? It takes, again, at least seven to 14 days for you to notice pinning from pretty much any mushroom. Once you've gotten to this point, you've mixed it up. First seven days, you should stay in the dark. You don't have to. Once that seven days is up though, 12 and 12. Typically, we're using like Floriflex clone strips. Um, they're like an 18 watt dual bar unit. You can get them for like 65, 70 bucks. Um, that'll do basically a five by 10 area so you do not need much light. Again, it's just there to give them a direction to grow up. If everything in the room seems like it's getting light, it's got more than enough light and it can do whatever it needs to do at that point. Um, so let's say you've got your pins, everything's starting, they're coming up nice, happy and thick. They're lush, beautiful. <coughs> You're getting ready to harvest, all right? Every time you go to open this bin, you need to be putting on gloves, you need to be spraying them down with alcohol before you pull anything out of there. So just keep that in mind. Now we're going to cheat, fast forward a little bit, and say that this bin has produced us a mushroom. All right, there is a multitude of different times that you're gonna pick your mushrooms and this and that and again this is where that little bit of research initially comes into play all right not all mushrooms are ready at the same time you'll have mushrooms that are ready to go once you've seen it pop it takes about three days it takes about five days some take seven days some take 163 days depends on the mushroom that you're growing if you're doing Anything in the culinary world, you can pretty much pull a mushroom whenever you want. Uh, as you get into more of the fancier stuff and you know all that good stuff, the fungi ones, they are uh, going to get a little bit more rough for you to figure out when you need to harvest on them. Um, but let's say that you found your mushroom that you want to clone. This is what is giving you your best cluster. This is giving you your uh, best yield, whatever have you, or it's just something that's just out of this world. Hey, congratulations, here's a quarter pound mushroom. I wanna grow this one again type thing. You're gonna prepare an agar plate. Um, you can do a couple different things. You can take a spore print from it, um, which would basically just be you taking a piece of tin foil, sterilizing it down with alcohol and basically just taking the cap of a mushroom and setting it on it, put something over the top, or I like to take the tin foil and make a little volcano just so air's not blowing around it so that spore print actually falls down. Um, that's a good way to preserve your genetics. Or if you have small enough caps, you can take a cap and directly place it onto an agar plate and it'll just start that whole process right up again for you right from scratch. Or 
you found a mushroom that you really like, you don't want to do a spore print because you want to keep that single isolation going. You can cheat and actually cut that mushroom in half and clone it. So, what we're going to do is pass it over. Vertical or horizontal? Uh, so you're going to go straight up and down with it. So basically what you'll do is you again clean up your area spray down the outside of the plates, wipe it down, whatever you need to do. You'll pull off the wrap from it, <coughs> get your scalpel, uh, make sure you sterilize it. With the scalpel itself, you want to go a little bit hotter and actually get that glowing tip to it. A little bit of carbon on it, if you were to use just like a regular lighter like this, doesn't hurt anything, it's totally fine. That doesn't mean anything to it. Um, but what you're going to do is essentially if it'll come off, you're going to find, we'll call it your biggest, healthiest mushroom out of them. Your scalpel's cooled down. You will cut down the center about three quarters of the way. Um, on larger mushrooms, if you got a bigger scalpel, it works a little bit better. But essentially, if you get three quarters of the way, you want to pull it up over. And again, you don't want to be working directly over your agar, but get that little chunk right on in there. <coughs> You're going to take your micro pour tape, seal it back up. In about five to seven days, that plate should be pretty much fully colonized, as long as everything around it is good and healthy. And of course, I can't get this tape out. No, you would obviously be able to tell if there's contamination if it don't start. Oh yeah, so what would end up happening, like let's say I took something like this where it was nice, healthy, you know, you'll see that mass start to grow. And if, let's say I took the top off of this all the way and something got in there, it'll start showing up like little islands. The mycelium will grow towards that uh, contamination. It'll come in contact with it and then all of a sudden you'll just see a little island where nothing wants to grow right there and something's coming up a little bit different. All you have to do at that point, take the nice healthy mycelium over here, put it onto another agar plate. That plate should be clean if you kept with the proper, you know, sterile process and everything like that, and you should be so good you to go. Save them if you have to. Exactly. The whole point of agar is to save genetics. It's you're not going to grow a mushroom out of this plate. But that's basically like your mother. Exactly. But, you know, this is your mom that you're able to keep in the fridge and keep for a year without yeah. having to feed or. Here's light or this or no. that. What if you was to take, let's say you're getting low on that, mm -hmm. take it and put it in another one. Correct. And then just keep going yep. again. Yeah. Okay. So Good. you typically, for most agar plates, we recommend changing them out every three to four generations. Um, same like if you were doing like a spawn to spawn transfer, because like what we do in house is we got a nice white bag like this. We'll you know, have a four pound block of spawn and a bunch of these substrates ready to go. And we'll take about a quarter cup of that spawn out of that bag and throw it into another bag to get another bag started. So it just depends on how you want to go yeah. about it. So when you go three, four generations or whatever with that, you, you want to get something take new. What you just did yep. with the month, the, the cut mushroom in half or yep. whatever. Broken out again. Exactly. So you still keep the same genetics. Yep. You're just new. progressing that isolation now. Yeah, yeah. So like at any point you come across a bigger, better version of what you have, scoop that little wow. bastard out and put it right onto a plate. Nice. That's your best way of going about it. Um, there is one other method that we do um, in-house or one different style of growing that we do in-house, which is our all-in-one bags, which we're going to be wrapping off a couple. So essentially your entire process that we've gone over from beginning to end is done inside of this bag. This is, besides bins, your easiest way to ever get started. Um, you're gonna go through everything just the way you did it before. You'll spray off the patch, three to five ml into the bag. You'll rotate it around, try to get that moisture around the grain as best you can. And you're gonna forget about it for a couple of weeks. You're gonna come back. Hard part. Exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. honestly, a big thing that we run into with people 
is, hey man, I've been checking my bag every day for the last two weeks. All right? All of your mycelium has moved around and bruised so much, it's done. It gave up on you. You beat the crap out of it. All right? Watch it dead. Once you rotate it and you set it onto a shelf, put a mental two-week timer on it before you even bother to look at it. Exactly. You know, like, you have to let them sit and do their own thing. A mushroom's going to do what a mushroom's going to do, regardless of your feelings and what you do around it. You just need to let it actually do it. Exactly. Exactly. And even then, it's still really hard because everybody looks at it and wants to go and pick it up and go, oh, is that that a turn? You know, and then they start poking it and doing X, Y, and Z with it. That's not what you want to do. So, we've inoculated it. It's been sitting on a shelf for a few weeks. It got nice and white on the bottom here. You're going to break up the entire contents of this bag inside this bag. At this point, it should be filled up with a little bit of CO2, making it easier to mix it all around. Once you mix it, you have 7 to 14 days, and this block will turn white again. You'll get to this point here. So what would be the earliest time to check it again? Uh, two weeks. I do a two-week okay. mental note. Right. No, I'm just saying that, that way people know, too, that yeah. at least two weeks let it go. And then yep. Okay. Two weeks from time of start is how long you want to leave it alone before I ever even come back to check it. Just think about it. If you look at it within two weeks, you're going to kill it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I kind of just look at the mycelium to grow. Correct. Because it's going to start, nine times out of ten, it's going to start at the very bottom here, or it's going to start right behind the injection port. So if you have those two little areas visible to you in a tent or on a rack, whatever, you can just go, oh, there we go, you know? Yeah, looking at them like that, just don't pick exactly. it up. Exactly. Basically, if it hits a four-week mark and you see nothing, Chances are it was a bad syringe or it was a bad bag. Call me. We'll get it figured out. You know what I mean? But let's say this bag has reached this where it's nice and white all around it. There's a couple different ways that you can fruit in the bags, which is what I wanted to come back to on this. So in an all-in-one and in these, you can do two different ways of actually fruiting these. You can either cut the tops open, let that fresh air in, It'll grow, it'll top fruit, it'll do whatever you want it to do. Um, what we tend to do with most of our top fruiters, minus this one, because it decided it was gonna have a jailbreak out of the side of the bag. Um, we'll put rubber bands around the top of these bags. That stops the growth on the side. It so stops the, you know, the side pinning. No matter what you do, any style of growing, you are going to get side fruiting pins. It is the nature of the beast. It happens over time. Things time suck in, you know, all that fun stuff. They're gonna do what they're gonna do. Exactly. Mushroom's gonna do what a mushroom's gonna do. Um, but we'll put that rubber band about an inch and a half to two inches down below the actual top here. Um, that'll stop all the side pins from down low and in turn will allow you to harvest off of the top of these a couple of times before everything below it's finally getting you know fresh air and this and that because every time you harvest you're going to be pulling a little bit of uh, mycelium up with it like in a perfect world where i just pulled this from i would be taking this entire cluster trying to get to substrate again you do not want to leave behind any remnants from what you're harvesting all right anything that's left behind right there is going to rot it's gonna bruise, it's gonna sit there over time. That's the weakest point, all right? That's your cancer cell getting infected, you know? So, uh, you can do either a couple little slits across the top here. Uh, we did one on each side on these, and then you just cover it with micro pore tape. That's really all you need to get that fresh air in there to actually initialize the um, uh, fruiting process. Whereas like this one, hey, all we have to do is really just reopen that bag, fluff it a couple of times. That's going to be enough fresh air to actually get it fruiting. It just depends on how you want to go about it. In-house, personally, <coughs> you tend to just rubber band it, cut the entire top off of this like a sock. Um, so it's you can just pull right back over it. You can adhere it with the rubber band again so you can rehydrate the block or whatever the case may be. Now, what's the best way to rehydrate it? Soak it in water? Yeah, so typically, um, 
out how did I work out the math for this. So for a 16 quart um, bin, you're using roughly 500 to 750 milliliters of distilled water to rehydrate that block. That should leave you with a little bit of water to maybe be poured off, but it should be enough to fully expand out that block. You let it sit in roughly 10 to 15 minutes. Anything longer than that, and <coughs> it's going to start building up uh, areas for bacteria, trichoderma, whatever. Um, now, it's, with that being said, how about the contamination and cleaning that? I mean, yes, yeah, it's distilled water, but. So, typically, if you're using distilled water, um, and you're using appropriate amounts, like it'll take you a couple of times to get the hang of it and get the feel for how much water it actually takes. Um, but I mean, you could cheat and on a bag like this, poke a hole in the bottom, let it drain out, cover it with micropore tape. Chances are you're gonna get a mushroom that grows out of it. That's gonna stop your contaminations from coming in. Are you, you, always, know? <laughs> are you always using the distilled water or could you also use boiled water? What does it? You can use boiled water, you can use distilled water, you can use whatever your heart desires, just as long as it's not tap. Like, I personally recommend people get like our small ROs, dechlorinators at now, least. The pH? Uh, the pH doesn't really matter for this. The, all of the substrate is already uh, pH to a point where you're gonna be at a higher base. So it's, even if you added in something, let's say the water you added was coming off the tap at uh, 7.2 or 6.8 or 6.5, it's still going to be fine for what you added to the bag because it's of the gym cells. in the water, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah. So, again, you either just cut a couple slits, put your micropore tape across it, or you can remove the entire thing, or you can remove it and use it as a sock, depending on how you want to go about it. Again, in-house, on our racks, typically, we're just cutting this whole top off, we're setting them there on the rack, and they will fruit out entirely. We'll get about two to three harvests off of those typically in the bags. And then we just weigh, hey, how much is this one giving us? Okay, you know, your first harvest is always really good. Your second harvest is always usually a little bit bigger. Your third harvest, all of a sudden, you went from having mushrooms this big to having mushrooms this big, but way less of them. So, I mean, at some point, you're going to have to weigh out what is the reward versus me just going ahead and, hey, I've got six other bags on the rack here that are ready to be transplanted and can take its spot. So you'll see it as you're progressing throughout this entire process of, okay, I put you know my oysters into this bag, it gave me a pound and a half off of the first one. The second one gave me two and a quarter. The third one, I'm back down to a pound and a half. The fourth one, I'm down to a pound. Okay, you know, it's still worth it. I'll keep it for one more. All right, the next one, you got a half a pound. All right, I'd rather bring a brand new one back in, get back up to that pound and a half that I had on the first run and keep everything moving like that, so. I might get a stupid question, but are you talking about reusing the bag? Yeah, so product? when, I let's say this was a top fruiting bag, they weren't fruiting outside here. Mm -hmm. I would pluck my mushrooms in three to five days, more mushrooms are going to grow out of that bag. Another five to seven days, more mushrooms will be growing. Another seven to ten will be growing. Another ten to fourteen will be growing in those intervals, basically. Um, throughout that process, you'll get about three or four of those harvests out of it, and then you'll have to rehydrate it. You'll get another one to two harvests if you're really lucky at that point, and depending on the genetic. Like most of your culinary mushrooms are just gonna keep going until there's literally nothing left of this block. You'll start with a four pound block and what you're left with in the end is literally a golf ball. It okay. eats everything in that bag. So it's again, just, <laughs> hey, this is how much mass I have here and this is how much it's yield, uh, yielding for me. Is it really worth it or should I just take this and compost it in the garden, put a new bag in its place because I mean, if you're not getting anything off of it to eat or do X, Y, and Z with, what's the point, you know? Well, with compost and putting it back in the garden, you run the chance of growing them in the garden, right? You do, yeah. Oh, so yeah. They grow a lot bigger outside, too. They do. Um, usually outside, your CO2 levels aren't what they would be inside, because, like, let's say this was just a closed-off area and we were all working in a room. 
the CO2 levels in there would be probably close to like 1,200 to 2,000 with this many people if we were all talking at the same time. So you don't have that outside. You got the wind blowing around outside your ambient CO2 levels is anywhere from 300 parts per million to I think like 550 depending on where you live. But yeah, they get way bigger. They also have the symbiotic relationships outside. Yeah, inside it makes more sense. Yeah, inside you just have what's in the bag. That's it. Yeah. Hopefully, if you you know you don't have any contaminations X, Y, and Z. Outside, there is so many other bacteria and fungi that are out <laughs> there that will coexist with each other and go. Hey, we're gonna give you X, Y, and Z. You're gonna give us A, B, and C. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So those relationships outside you just can't match them indoors right yeah you bring them indoors and no matter right. how scientific you want to get with it and go i've isolated this bacteria that's supposed to do this with this all right mother nature does it on her own outside you're not going to replicate her yeah. you're going to get close and you're going to feel you know slightly better about it but you're never going to get what you would get outside right and in some instances with certain strains you'll never get outside what you can get inside you know, it just depends on what you're doing. Like, I can grow morels in bags, all right? Is it gonna taste the same as if I had found it outside in a patch? Not at all, you know? It's not even remotely close, because you have these symbiotic relationships that are allowing these different profiles and different things to go through and actually react and create these things. I think lion mane's another one. Huh? Lion mane's another one that grows Oh, it goes amazing. You can stick that thing pretty much anywhere. Those in the oyster, lion's mane, oysters, most turkey tail strains, like things of that nature. Uh, Reishis will grow basically out of cement if you let it. Are there certain <laughs> plants that uh, help them proceed better? Like if you keep them around certain trees and that, do you see a better yield outside? It depends on the strain that you are working with. Like... If you were, so like most strains, you're either gonna have a dung-loving mushroom or you're gonna have a hardwood-loving mushroom. Anything in the hardwood mushroom category, oysters, lion's mane, turkey tail, chicken of the woods, that, you know, the list goes on. All of those are gonna grow better around trees and having that mice, uh, that actual network that's going on around the base of trees and that rhizosphere like that's how you get truffles you know like truffles yeah you can grow them indoors not the same you don't have all that mycelium network that's coexisting along everything in the rhizosphere around these trees that are actually aiding to it to get it to that point or fighting off whatever else could be competing that's harmful to it so just again it comes down to just a little bit of research before you get started on whatever you're going to do is going to save you a long pain in the butt in the, long, in the end. So, um, but yeah. Basically, if you find like something like the mycoccus that you grow outside, yep. they're probably going to be more healthier. If they're growing, they're going to be healthy. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Okay. If it, again, though, Those if you're going to be doing hardwood, more yeah, Dead but if you're going to be doing any foraging, make sure that you are 100% certain in what you're about to eat. While all mushrooms are edible, most of them are only edible once. So, <laughs> just throwing that out there. But, yeah. Is there a way to tell, like, the outdoor, indoor, or, like, some of those foraging from mushrooms? Is there, like, a telltale sign of something that you can do not want to eat? Um, if it looks like something out of a cartoon, usually nature is a very yeah. finicky mistress. Um, usually if it's bright and colorful, nature didn't hide it for a reason because it's already going to do whatever it wanted to do damage-wise to you. So um, there is a ton of resources though for you as far as foraging-wise. Um, there's quite a few apps on iPhone and Android where you can take pictures of the gills take pictures of the mushroom, show where it was growing around, and it'll give you an idea of what it could have been or can be or this or that. There is a good portion of them though that are so similar. One little variation in just how the gill actually forms is the difference between you eating something that's healthy and you eating something poisonous. So just always do some type of research on it unless you have like a PhD and you know, all this stuff. Uh, 
research. You mentioned being a real important to look up every you know different types of strains you're trying to grow. Is there yep. a resource that you use for that? Is there something that you go to uh, like sort of Honestly, use? they're really it's just Google. Because I'm not going to lie, your best bet for anything that you're going to research, have at least two to three points of reference for it. So if you go through and there's, uh, you got a hundred Reddit articles, you got that, this guy, you got that guy, this company says do this, this company says do that. Look through them and find the correlations where they're exactly alike. And if something's not linking up between the three, chances are, one or two of those guys is just trying to sell you something and the other guy is actually looking out for you. Because yeah. like our biggest thing is, we get people calling us and telling us, hey, I put the entire syringe into my bag and I didn't get anything from it. Or hey, I put two syringes into my bag because I saw this video online. You need three to five ml to start any bag. Yeah. Like any company that tells you you need more than 10 mls, they just want you to buy more syringes, they want you to buy more of this, buy more of that. I'm not in the business of making you buy more of X, Y, and Z. I'm in the business of helping you guys and getting you to a point where you feel confident in the products that you're using. You don't feel confident, you're not ever gonna buy my product, you're not gonna use my product. You're gonna look at Brandon or one of these guys and go, hey, fuck that guy, you know? <laughs> like, so. Um, what what kind of substrate do you have in them all in one? All in so one. the all-in-ones, we do two different styles. We do have a hardwood all-in-one that they can order. We typically, that one's mostly an online sale only for yeah. our store. We don't get a lot of stores that really ask for them. Most of the stores want like our Lion's Main kits where they're pre-started. Um, the big one for us is the CVG all-in-ones. So your CVG is gonna be for any of the dung-loving mushrooms. Um, yeah. Everything else, hardwood pretty much. Like all your culinaries are basically going to be hardwood. Yeah. Any questions or any other things? I'll be around for a little while. We do have business cards up here if anybody wants to take them. Like us, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and all that fun stuff. You can hit us up anytime.